Well, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. My name is uh, James Wilmot, and it's uh, a real uh, pleasure for me to welcome you to the 10th edition of the European Data Protection and Privacy Conference. I'm uh, only going to take up uh, a few minutes, a short time, uh, uh, before we uh, get to the, the main event, but I hope you'll allow me to say a few words on how we're going to run the event today and also uh, come on to some uh, words of thanks before I hand over to, uh, to Paul shortly. Um, firstly, a brief nostalgic interlude, if I may. I cannot uh, kick off the 10th edition of this conference uh, without reflecting a little on the journey that this event has been on. Um, up until 2010, uh, we at Forum Europe had been uh, covering privacy very much in contained uh, vertical sectors, such as border management and, and biometrics. And the debate around privacy had not really developed into the huge horizontal pan-European and global issue that it's uh, that it eventually became uh, with the development of the of the GDPR. And uh, over this uh, time, the conference tracked GDPR's development and implementation, and emerged as one of, and uh, if I may say so, uh, if not the principal uh, independent privacy conference uh, in in Brussels. I had a, a quick look back this morning at some of the speakers and organizations who were present back in 2010, uh, and while many of the names have changed, some are uh, consistent uh, and remain. Um, I should in particular like to mention uh, Tom Abue uh, from uh, BSA, the Software Alliance, who I um, believe have been uh, ever-present and whose support to the conference we're always grateful for. Um, and they actually have a dedicated session, which I should probably reference coming up a little later this morning. Uh, that I'd encourage you to to attend. Uh, that early edition also included people um, such as Vivian Redding, uh, Peter Hustings, um, uh, Jakob Konstam, uh, Udo uh, Helmbrecht, to name a few. Uh, and we're again very grateful for the engagement uh, in this conference from those responsible for developing privacy policy today. Uh, and I'd like to add my uh, thanks before I do hand over to Paul to both Vice President uh, uh, Urova, who has always been very generous with her time, and that's uh, something that we that we certainly don't take for granted, Vice President, uh, and also uh, to the European Data Protection Supervisor, um, Wojciech Wierowski, uh, with whom Forum Europe has collaborated over the years, uh, and in particular, and quite intensively in 2018 on the uh, ICD uh, PPC, which was, which was held in Brussels. Um, and on the EDPS, uh, I can't either proceed uh, without once again uh, paying tribute to uh, Giovanni Buterelli, with, with whom we worked uh, with alongside uh, Wojciech uh, on the 2018 ICD PPC, uh, and who was also a regular uh, and inspiring figure at the European Data Protection and Privacy Conference. It's been uh, over a year now since Giovanni sadly passed away, um, and in this 10th year of our conference, it does give us an opportunity again to mark the, the contribution uh, to policy thinking uh, in the area that he made. So to this year in more detail, a few quick remarks on the platform. Um, I'm not going to labor this as there will be plenty of reminders uh, during the day, but you should notice on the right-hand side of your screen that there is a, a chat area. And I would encourage you uh, to post your comments and questions for the speakers in this chat space and the moderators for the various sessions will, will do their very best to include uh, as much of your input as uh, possible. In the left-hand menu, you'll notice the reception, the stage, uh, networking, expo tabs. Again, I'm sure some of you are already sort of familiar with this. Um, we're in the, the, the stage currently, uh, but I would encourage you between sessions to jump into the networking and expos uh, where you can talk on camera with your fellow participants and also uh, discover some additional great content. Uh, there's some stuff in there about Forum Europe. Um, finally, on the platform, uh, you can, if you wish, utilize the People tab, which is on the right-hand side, to contact each other privately via, uh, via chat, or if you wish to invite each other to one-to-one -one, uh, conversations on camera, this is also possible. All the communications are private. Um, some people use this, and our experience is um, that for those that do, it greatly enhances their experience. So uh, this functionality is there and available to you uh, to use if you wish to, to do so. Um, my thanks to this year's conference sponsors, namely uh, BSA, the Software Alliance, uh, Baker McKenzie, Cisco, the EDAA, uh, Google, Microsoft, SAP, uh, and Salesforce. Um, we're all very well aware that 
the virtual setting bring, uh, brings plenty of opportunities. Uh, for instance, um, we have almost uh, 800 people registered today. Well, I think the latest is 799 uh, at, the, at the last glance uh, from around Europe, from the US. Uh, I spotted India, South America, China, the list goes on. Um, but in-person conferences uh, remain the, the optimal means for engaging with each other. And so we really do appreciate the ongoing support uh, in, the, in the current environment. And I'd also like to thank uh, all of our speakers across the day for participating and also to give a shout out to uh, my Forum Europe colleagues for all their hard work uh, in bringing this edition of the conference together, in particular Annalise, uh, Rebecca, Jerry, uh, and David. And as I have you all here, and you're certainly not going to go anywhere at this stage when we have the Vice President to follow, uh, I wanted to bring to your attention and unashamedly plug a relatively new initiative that Forum Europe and Encompass has embarked on, uh, very much the brainchild of uh, Forum Europe's chairman, Paul Adamson, uh, and that's the new EU-UK uh, forum. The forum has been set up uh, to be a neutral platform for debate on the ongoing deliberations and future relationship between the EU and the UK, and we already have uh, held a number of debates, um, online debates, I should say, uh, that I'm sure you'll find interesting. It's a membership-based uh, organization, and you can find more details on this, um, and I think it came along the bottom there um, uh, at the, uh, and, well, and our upcoming schedule events, I should say, for the new year also, at eu-ukforum.com. So I think this is the uh, first time since April that I've managed to get through opening remarks without mentioning COVID, but needless to say, from everyone here at Forum Europe, we hope you and your families are safe and well. We really appreciate you participating today, uh, and we wish you an excellent day of discussions and debate. So I'll now hand over to Forum Europe's uh, Chairman, Paul Adamson, uh, who will moderate this uh, first session. So Paul, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. And let me also welcome all of you, all 800 of you, to this uh, annual conference that we hold uh, now, now virtually. Hopefully next year we'll be back to this more normal physical manifestation. Uh, it's quite rare, you know, this year of webinars to devote a whole day to a, a single topic, but we are going to try and do that today. Nine hours of discussion coming up as, a, as of now on data privacy and data protection. So we are doing the subject certainly proud. So in the course of the day, we'll be having sessions on delivering the full potential, potential of EU data protection principles, shaping the future of data privacy globally, data privacy and the transatlantic relationship, data privacy globally, responsible uh, data use, trust and emerging technologies towards a European way of handling data, cross-border electronic evidence and law enforcement, uh, what it means for data privacy and fundamental rights, and finally, e-privacy cookies and data retention. Can a future-proofed framework for the digital society be achieved. Uh, we're going to start, my, my very pleasant uh, task to begin with is to uh, introduce uh, European Vice President Vera Jourova, Vice President for Va Values and Transparency at the European Commission. As James said, uh, Vera, Commissioner, Madam Vice President, you've always been extremely generous with your time. And I think I'm right in saying that you've given the opening uh, keynote address to our annual Data Privacy Protection Conference every year since you first became a Commissioner six years ago. It seemed like yesterday, but it was actually six years ago you made your first appearance at one of our conferences. Conferences. So thank you very much again for your time. And without further ado, Vera, Madam Vice President, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Good morning to everybody. Well, indeed, we have some common history, our <laughs> part of, of life, uh, six years. It, it's quite a long time. And every year I was happy to come and to share the views and especially in the times uh, around the adoption and then uh, coming into force of GDPR, it was in, in, important for me also to hear your feedback. And, and indeed, over those six years, the temperature went up and down after we adopted GDPR. Was it enough? Was it strong enough? Uh, will it be sufficient? Many questions then, then when GDPR came into force in 2017. Uh, it was uh, shortly after Cambridge Analytica case when many people realized that uh, we definitely need to protect our privacy better. Uh, then uh, it was the moment of truth and we, we in some member states had a tough task to explain to people that this is something for them, that this is not just a burden for the company. So we have some history together and I'm really happy to be to be here today with you, even though only, only through the, the screen. 
Uh, I would like to cover two topics. Uh, of course, uh, GDPR as, as uh, data protection itself, and and also maybe to reflect on how GDPR is helping us to uh, uh, make or to take uh, further policy responses on, on different matters, such as, for instance, artificial intelligence and, and the reaction on, on the development of technologies. Uh, I will start with GDPR and its uh, role in this uh, pandemic or uh, COVID-19 crisis. I think that GDPR proved to be crisis proof. Uh, uh, we all see the data and technology have helped us and is helping us in the fight against the pandemic in the gradual lifting of the restrictions, for instance, or in keeping our borders open. Uh, GPR shows that it is not an obstacle to the processing of personal data, even health data, if they are necessary to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, the necessary conditions and appropriate safeguards need to be in place. Uh, and we recognize that technology can benefit us and help us to combat the virus, but also uh, we uh, have to react on the possible risks. So we um, uh, issued in April this year the, the guidance uh, where we supported the development of so-called contact tracing apps uh, which alert people who have been in close proximity to an infected person for a certain duration so that they can take necessary actions to protect themselves and the people around them and in this way the infection transmission can be rapidly interrupted so this is a great help and we we should uh, use our uh, technologies for this uh, very good purpose and of course uh, we had to stress that these apps have to be voluntary secure interoperable and respect people's privacy the identity of the COVID infected persons will always remain anonymous furthermore the apps should function everywhere in the eu across borders and across operating systems this is why together with the member states we took a common approach for efficient contact tracing and warning apps Users installing one app and traveling to another participating European country can benefit from contact tracing and receiving alerts. Uh, I dare say that GDPR is a milestone and a big success, but implementation work is ongoing, and this is what was uh, already declared uh, several times in, in our GDPR review, which was a kind of uh, uh, report assessing the functioning of GDPR in practice. Uh, so so GD, GDPR uh, turned out to be, in my view, a success story, but also we should remain humble because it is also work in progress. We need to continue working together with the European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Supervisor to further fine-tune concepts and approaches to make them more pragmatic and more understandable. European citizens were empowered to use their rights and take control of their data. At the same time, European companies could compete and innovate, benefiting from a level playing field. Even the former critics of the GDPR are now acknowledging its values. Now we are entering the next phase where strong data protection guarantees will increasingly be a competitive advantage. So this is something we were saying from the beginning that uh, in some in, in the course of, of some time uh, the, competi the competitive advantage will will be more obvious than at the beginning. But we need to improve certain aspects, in particular regarding enforcement. This needs to be timely and effective. And I am confident that the data protection authorities will make full use of their corrective powers to enforce these rules. And member states need to provide them with adequate resources that reflect their multiple, multiple tasks. I can only repeat that if there are low capacities, uh, low budget, I am always ready to lobby in the member states. I have done it many times and I spoke to many ministers of finance, especially in the countries where data protection as a principle is still a kind of underestimated. So I, I'm ready to help. Uh, also, uh, GDPR needs to be interpreted in the same way across the EU. 
cooperation in cross-border cases and within the European Data Protection Board will be vital to achieve this. Only this way we will achieve a truly common European data protection culture across our union. I hear over again that especially smaller firms struggle with the implementation of the GDPR. I would like, like to call upon data protection authorities to develop practical tools and support them. And this is indeed not for the first time, not the second time I am saying that. The SMEs still need some help and some explanation and, and some maybe guidance. They want to uh, have full legal certainty that they will not be penalized for something they, they, they don't fully understand. I would like to address all the, all, all the authorities to help the SMEs and say that they can uh, also benefit from financial support through grants aimed at supporting these efforts. We are still offering the support for marketing and for, for awareness raising campaigns. Effective implementation and enforcement are necessary to acquire people's trust that their data will be handled properly. This trust is crucial and uh, this is crucial, especially for businesses seeking new opportunities in the digital economy. And uh, when I said that GDPR is, uh, is the core element for our policy uh, responses, now we are just a few days before adopting the Digital Services Act. So I also want to touch upon this uh, this bridge or, or connection with, with other things we are doing now, or the, the things we are doing now in uh, uh, defining the rules for, for digital sphere. Uh, it will be not only a Digital Services Act. Uh, we, will, we are looking at whether the artificial intelligence sphere needs regulation. We are looking at uh, the emerging technologies like blockchain, Internet of Things, or facial recognition. Uh, we need all these new technologies and, and fantastic technological endeavors to be fully compliant with our data protection rules. And uh, a human-centric, data-driven economy means that data protection goes hand in hand with innovation. Our strong data protection rules have become foundation on which we are shaping our European response to digital transition. They are an important element of our, what I call, European digital soul. So now, Digital Services Act, it will clarify the responsibilities of actors in the digital economy who will have due diligence obligations. We will expect providers of digital services to act responsibly to protect users from illegal content. Providers will also have to be transparent when moderating content and using algorithms and content recommender systems. In designing the DSA rules and procedures, the GDPR has been a source of inspiration and good practices. To ensure appropriate enforcement, the DSA will build on the basis created by the GDPR and reinforce the cooperation among competent authorities as well as coordination at the EU level. Regarding issues related to data, the DSA will increase the obligations of platforms to comply with information requests submitted by supervisory authorities. The DSA may enable researchers to access data from platforms, but under center certain strict conditions and with the objective of verifying compliance with the new rules. These provisions will be fully aligned with the GDPR. Also, a few words about artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, we have big hopes and big plans. This technology can definitely help us in so many important different areas from education, matching individual children's needs, new diagnose, diagnosis, treatment and prevention of COVID-19 by results analysis of chest imagining and so on. We are uh, conscious of the fact that data-driven AI systems can be biased and that automated decision-making systems can be flawed or inaccurate. We should not let them violate 
other rights and, for instance, allow discrimination. We should not let AI replace human decision making, especially in sensitive areas. We will also not let it be used for surveillance purposes infringing individual rights. We will be looking at transparency and traceability of AI systems work. We will put forward a proportionate and risk-based legal framework for artificial intelligence. And we will do that uh, for the sake of individuals. As I said, everything we do, we, we uh, pay full attention to the right of individual people. But also we want to do that to stimulate innovation and Europe's competitiveness. We have spoken about the GDPR and economy, especially digital economy, but my recent work on the European Democracy Action Plan was a reminder that GDPR is also relevant for democracy, especially when it comes to political campaigning. We all know that digital advertising also in political context is based on a huge amount of personal data, on profiling and on micro-targeting, often underpinned by artificial intelligence. I strongly believe that the methods of selling products should not be the same when it comes to promoting political ideas. We have made it clear already in 2018 that political parties and other actors involved in elections need to respect GDPR that provides special protection for political views and imposes limitations for micro-targeting and other automated decision-making practices. I have a strong suspicion that we will see still lack of compliance in this field. I want to therefore call again on the European Data Protection Board and data protection authorities to be particularly vigilant and act forcefully when it comes to data processing for political purposes. But even outside the electoral context, we are facing crucial challenges for our democracies. I am thinking of disinformation and foreign interference that attempt to manipulate people at an unprecedented scale using social media as a tool. This is why we announced working on a new legislative proposals to ensure greater transparency of paid political advertising. This is why we will overhaul the code of practice on in disinformation to strengthen it and close the existing gaps, especially in a way that online platforms address this problem. Civil society and researchers are also calling for greater transparency from online platforms and as relevant better access to data, particularly from Facebook. And here again, I am happy to see that the GDPR does not prohibit that platforms share data with the researchers to unveil patterns of disinformation. The GDPR is not a valid excuse for platforms not to share data. I heard these uh, comments several times, for, from, especially from the big tech, so uh, I think that there is no, no uh, reason to think that our GDPR is the barrier for sharing the data. And by the way, also I heard it many times from the journalists that uh, uh, some governments and some official places uh, uh, use GDPR as an excuse for not providing the public information. So uh, this is not what GDPR was designed for. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, as I said at the beginning, with a little bit of sentiment, we, uh, I am here for the sixth time with you, and we have had many ups and also some spectacular downs in that short history. But I must say I am really happy to see how the debate is evolving in Europe, but also globally. Strong data protection rules are finally seen as necessity, not a luxury. Strong data protection rules are becoming an important element of other policy areas, especially those in the digital sphere. Strong data protection rules are not only competitive differentiator, but a great example of how translate our values in legislative terms. Now we are shaping our response to other aspects of the online world, GDPR serves as an important inspiration, as a central reference point. 
the lessons we learn from it are increasingly more and more relevant. So I am very proud I had a chance to participate in this pioneering work with many people around our virtual table. And I'm confident that uh, GDPR will help us as an instrument in all the challenges that we will be facing in the new digital decade. It has a fundamental value that will guide us through the digital transition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vera. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, before I move to our next keynote, uh, I'd like to point out that I think the, uh, the commissioner can stay for a while. So if anybody watching this the discussion wants to ask questions now, the time to do it. It's kind of first come, first serve. We only have about 10 minutes at the end of our second keynote to try and answer all your questions. So the sooner you get in your questions, the better chance you have of that question being uh, tackled by our speakers. Now, let me turn to our second keynote address of this morning, Wojciech Wiborowski, who is the European Data Protection Supervisor. Uh, sir, you have the floor. A pleasure to see you, Wojciech. Uh, thank you very much and uh, first of all thank for having me uh, at the conference that's uh, also not my first time at the conference and i can say that 10 years ago when you were starting with it uh, i was taking part in the conference as a part of the audience as a new just elected uh, data protection commissioner in my country of origin in poland and uh, probably uh, the forum europe conference was the first international conference which i was taking part uh, in Brussels uh, as the Commissioner for Data Protection. So it, it's nice uh, to be here again. Uh, it's nice to meet all of you, even if this is only a virtual meeting, even if we only meet uh, through online devices for, for, for obvious uh, reasons. I'm going to give today, uh, as a beginning at the beginning of this conference, uh, a kind of a short guide to what happened uh, in the last uh, year. If I can ask my presentation to be put on, on, on the screen, uh, the, so that will be a short hitchhiker's guide to the personal data protection in the year of the plague. Uh, well, of course, I, I took the, the name from the famous book, uh, famous science fiction book, but that was not the science fiction what we had uh, this year. Uh, that was really the, 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 the practical introduction of the things uh, which we thought there are only the fears. Uh, in a different kind of uh, different kind of books, and the Hitchhiker Guide, uh, because it will not be a very uh, organized way of uh, uh, going uh, through the, the through the problem. That will be like it is in the hitchhiking. Uh, uh, we will be moving from place to place, trying to find the uh, the trying to find the right way to uh, present uh, the. Um, the direction. So we, we know where we are going, but we don't know where our next stop uh, will be. I can see that I have some problems with uh, going to another slide. So if I can, uh, I hope it will work. If not, I will ask the organizers to move the slide to the, to the next one. Uh, yes, can I then ask for assistance? Because I'm, I'm afraid that I cannot... Uh, uh, change uh, the slide uh, myself. Uh, so, uh, as I as I said, uh, that will not be an organized uh, uh, organized travel through all the events uh, which happened in uh, 2020. Uh, that will be just uh, going in the in a kind of azimuth, and uh, uh, okay. That's how we try to do something better, and it uh, appears not to work the way that we want. Okay, I will stay then uh, with the uh, with, with uh, saying the words uh, and having just uh, the the uh, first slide uh, on. Uh, I think that's the only way which I can do, or maybe. One more try. Okay, now I guess it works. Uh, okay, so Hitchhiker's Guide to, to the World That We Shouldn't uh, Panic About. That's how Brussels looked like uh, in uh, March uh, uh, 2020. So that was the city which uh, definitely not the, was, was not the one 
that we were uh, that we were expecting to have uh, in the most uh, one of the most crucial years uh, for data protections uh, in the history the year where we expected to have the real results uh, of the gdpr uh, reform the real results uh, of the a new way of approach uh, to the uh, personal data uh, protection. And uh, at the same time, that was the year where we found ourselves uh, in the middle of the crisis we didn't expect. That was not the first time that the crisis like that appeared. That's why I said about the year of the plug. The famous year of the plug happened when Isaac Newton tried to get into the, his university in Cambridge. And uh, because of the plug, he had to resign from a year in the university and spend a year in the countryside. And in this countryside, he invented cal calculus. He uh, advanced uh, with the gravity theory. So we have to ask ourselves, uh, how did we use uh, this uh, year of uh, plug for rethinking the, the way that we were approaching the privacy protection and the data protection? I have to say, that as the EDPS, as the European Data Protection Supervisor, at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the crisis, I had the doubts if we don't face the big pushback towards the privacy that was built for this years on the national, local, and European level, and which was built not only by the uh, by the activists of the data protection, but mainly by those who were pro processing the data. If this storm that was uh, uh, coming to uh, will be the real danger to the uh, to the um, idea as such and uh, to the practice of its uh, uh, implementation. Well, unfortunately, the kind of symbol of the year 2020 will be the lift that I found in one of the EU institutions. The lift which shows that we are still together, but we are standing back to back to each other, because we are afraid. We are doing the things differently. We are going to defend ourselves, but at the same time, not to forget that the principles of our fundamental rights did not change. The life is different, the work is different, the teaching and learning is different, and uh, this is also a different way of taking decisions. We are, that, that's the picture of the committee uh, of the parliament, the Liber committee, in the heart of the discussion. Of course, everybody is online, but I found myself that as a DPS, I lost the contact with the, uh, with the members of the European Parliament because we meet only officially. We don't exchange the ideas. So I took this mem somewhere from the internet uh, as a kind of hope uh, for the next year. So what was the most important events? What were the most important events? What were the most important challenges uh, in the year 2020 that we have to deal with? Of course, the COVID crisis once, uh, and the COVID crisis uh, uh, understood as the health-related measures uh, which uh, impacted the way that we are dealing with the personal data, but also teleworking and the distant and the remote education as the new ways of doing the things, but also new ways of tracking uh, how the things are done, tracking the, uh, the employees, uh, tracking the students, uh, tracking the teachers. Of course, somebody can say this is not new, that always existed or existed at least uh, for years. That's true, but not uh, in, this, uh, in the system where both uh, the uh, work, the evaluation of that, uh, and also the monitoring of the way that we work uh, is doing online. And uh, the Schrems 2 case uh, was an additional challenge uh, that we have to recognize and which we will be talking at, at the today's uh, conference as well. Well, the, the health measures, which may look like that, but which may also look like that. The uh, health measures, uh, which uh, requires us uh, to think uh, how the world will look like when we will go back to something which we will call the normality. 
what actions can we take, how the society should look like. That was these were the questions that I had to ask myself when I uh, decided to present the strategy of EDPS for next five years. Uh, the original uh, the original deadline for this sub strategy for for presenting it was the middle of March 2020. But of course, uh, we had to postpone it and rethink again if the COVID crisis changed it or not. It doesn't. It doesn't in the way that uh, the principles stayed the same and they are still in the middle of the, the, of the discussion in Europe. COVID is a game changer, but at the same time shows that in the accelerated uh, digital economy, uh, the effective guarantees uh, for considering data protection and privacy are actually one of the cornerstones uh, of the new uh, uh, of the new ways of uh, doing the things of the new ways of uh, digital approach. And uh, the Schrems judgment, uh, though it was uh, expected somehow, we knew that we will have uh, the uh, strong words uh, said by the Court of Justice uh, about the system that has been created. Uh, the uh, Schrems judgment uh, has also created the new uh, approach to the uh, tools other than the privacy shield. We expected the uh, discussion about the follow-up of the privacy shield. We probably didn't expect that the court will go that far in the explanation of what the principles should mean, what, the, uh, uh, what should be the general way of preparing the transfers uh, to, the, to the third countries. That's why both uh, the European Data Protection Board uh, and the Commission had to take directions uh, to prepare ourselves to create the system uh, for the future transfers, not only to the United States, which was questioned, but also to other third countries, uh, including, of course, the United Kingdom as another challenge that we have uh, for 2021. So the European Data Protection Board definitely will work uh, in order to prepare the harmonized approach uh, to, the, uh, to, to these the subjects. But we have to remember that the same people have to do, first of all, they uh, uh, re have to really take care of the complaints that were delivered uh, by the data subjects, at the same time remembering uh, that the GDPR is not only about data protection, it's also about data flow. Because as I said, and I will, uh, I will uh, stress it again, uh, the words that my predecessor Giovanni Buttarelli put in uh, his uh, last presentations in, in 2019, uh, we are not protecting the data. We are protecting the human being. And protection of the human beings uh, means at the same time taking care of the information of this uh, person, but also to allow the data to work for the good of the society. That's why we appreciated uh, the, the initiatives, uh, the new initiatives, the, the, I would say, groundbreaking initiatives uh, from, the, from the business. That's why we think that uh, the, the COVID has accelerated uh, the cooperation as well between different platforms, uh, between different uh, technological solutions uh, that exist. And that we also find uh, in the Commission work program for 2021. And uh, uh, we see that this program is uh, 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 still going to uh, create uh, the new fields uh, where the discussion on privacy has to exist. Uh, of course, that was what uh, uh, Commissioner Jourova said about uh, a while ago, uh, the, uh, with the, the uh, problems of uh, the uh, freedom of speech uh, being confronted at the same time with the uh, restrictions uh, to different kinds of misinformation. Uh, the rule of law uh, being the uh, basis uh, for all the discussions uh, about uh, the uh, rights uh, the persons have both from the more uh, uh, economic point of view, but also from the point of view of the uh, fundamental cornerstones uh, which Europe is built on, where the Article 16 of the Treaty of uh, Functioning of the, uh, of the European Union is one of the parts of. 
So uh, this uh, very chaotic uh, hitchhiker's guide to some points uh, in the history of 2020, I, th I think may serve uh, as the starting point uh, for more organized discussions that we will have in the panels to follow. Thank you once again for Forum Europe for uh, organizing this uh, uh, meeting uh, already the 10th time. And uh, I hope that it will give us uh, the, the, the uh, floor to discuss on the European approach uh, to the subject, uh, but also to intercultural and the global uh, future of the data protection and the privacy protection. Thank you. Paul, back to you. Thank you very much, Wojciech, and, and full mark for creativity, if I may say so. It's the first time I've seen a presentation which has managed to combine the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the work of Sir Isaac Newton. Extraordinary. Now, we're pressed for time, as usual, and I appreciate that Vera has to leave in, in a very short time, so I'm going to immediately move to a question from the audience. Uh, they're going to jump the queue, because uh, it's addressed to you, uh, Vera, before you have to leave us. Uh, it's quite a dense question, so bear with me, from Carsten Hess from Chess Europe. Uh, future GDPR portability could shift the, the control of a personal data back to individuals. A sector-specific example like existing PSD2 mechanism for payments ensures GDPR standards. If that could be applied to cross-sector personal data access, it could reduce the data dominance of gatekeeper platforms, enhance service offers of European providers to its customers. The current debate on the EU Data Act and data governance uh, seems to miss out on the consumer-centric view and solution. How do you respond to that, Vera? Uh, I will take this comment because this is not, uh, not a question. I will take this comment and we'll check uh, whether we are paying enough attention to that. All right, okay. Uh, a question to both of you then, if I may, from my side. Um, we were talking with both of you at the beginning about the implementation of GDPR two, two years on, and it's no secret to say that there was a, it was a highly controversial uh, proposal at the stage when it was a mere proposal, and many stakeholders uh, put forth their views very robustly for many, for a very long time, and you in, inside the institutions had to contend with that and, and try and work out a, a way forward. But once the, the regulation was adopted two years ago, uh, did you have a feeling, both of you, that uh, the, the, the battle was now over and that it would, have, would go to, forward to a relatively harmonious implementation? I ask the question because you both uh, say quite clearly in your interventions that uh, there's much work to be done still in its implementation. You use the phrase where it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, the, the Commission's two-year assessment uses similar language. Uh, starting with you, Vera, are you surprised? I, mean, not, I don't want to exaggerate, but are you surprised by the the extent to which certain member states have not really implemented uh, and interpreted, to use your word, uh, the GDPR, uh, as, as they might have done? Well, I, I am, uh, if I can express my feeling, I am relieved uh, that it did not uh, kill innovations, that it did not uh, cause extremely big troubles to, to the companies which uh, were at the same time very nervous about, uh, about GDPR and whether they are able to uh, to comply with the rules, uh, but uh, there is, there is no space for for being uh, happy and say this is over. Uh, the the work has to continue. Still, a lot of uncertainty, as I said before, for for the SMEs. Also, some uh, in uh, some some unequal, uh, if I may say it like that, uh, approaches from different member states. Um, it, it must be uh, equally expensive to cheat <laughs> and uh, we, we have still to harmonize the approaches. This is the work for, for the data protection, uh, European Data Protection Board and Data Protection Authorities. Uh, also the one-stop shop and the proper capacities to, to have in place so that the procedures are, are uh, effect, efficient and, and also transparent and, and, and quick enough. Uh, I think that there are still a, a lot of things to, to be improved, but uh, uh, relief because, uh, you know, there was a lot of panic uh, when I was in 2015 and 16 in Silicon Valley. Uh, Silicon Valley was panicking in 2016. 
And then in 2000, at the end of 2016, the big tech told me, yes, we are ready because they, they had an army of lawyers and an army of expert capacities and technologies, technologies, to, uh, technologies to, to upgrade their systems. But I was thinking about the, the smaller European companies which will have to deal, deal with, uh, with uh, the, the compliance uh, task so uh when i saw the european businesses uh, kind of panicking I, I was really nervous it was at the end of 2016 uh, beginning 17 and some uh, uh, false prophets uh were uh, speaking about the doomsday and <laughs> it it didn't materialize it didn't happen so let's work together to improve the implementation and, and clarity and legal certainty uh, I think that this is this is the response, and also let's be reasonable and pragmatic about the proportionate use. Yeah, so it is coming back to to the issue of the SMEs. Thank you. Well, let me quickly uh, reword the, the question to you, Wojciech. I know that Vera has to leave us in, in one minute, um, and I'm quoting now that the the, the two-year review of the Commission put out back in May, and it says, I, I quote. Developing a truly common European data protection culture between data protection authorities is still an ongoing process. Uh, data protection authorities have not yet made full use of the tools the GDPR provides, such as joint operations that could lead to joint investigations. At times, finding a common approach meant moving to the lowest common denominator, and as a result, opportunities to foster more harmonization were missed. Is that a, is that a fair critique? And can you see a way forward that so when there's a review in another in this time or in six months time we will not be making the same kind of comments um, is it a question to me or to, 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 uh, the... you watch we're talking about the culture between data protection authority then you oversee I can say that uh, I, I can find the work of the data protection authorities uh, quite harmonious and uh, uh, it, it of course takes a while to to, to have the agreement of uh, uh, 27 countries plus three countries of the European Economic Area plus EDPS. But on the other hand, so far, if there was any kind of vote inside the European Data Protection Board, and uh, if some of the countries, let's say, lost this vote, so they had a different way of uh, interpretation than the majority of the countries, it has never been expressed uh, outside. So the data protection authorities found that despite they are independent, Despite their independence is fully uh, fully defended by the GDPR, they, the, the, the harmonious approach to the data protection is more important than their own points of views. I hope it will not change in the, in, in the future. The, the, the second thing which I would like to add here is the fact that, that the, uh, the, a lot of the practical uh, things lie in the uh, procedures which are uh, which are available in the member states we do not have the special harmonized procedure for data protection uh, cases uh, in the administrative law we don't have even administrative law in some of the member states so these parts are definitely to be uh, to, to to be overcome by the uh, data protection authorities that stops a little bit the joint uh, actions uh, by the data protection authorities. But we proposed as the EDPS, uh, the idea, together with the CNIL, uh, the idea of the pool of experts to help in this kind of uh, international cooperation inside Europe. I'm afraid you are muted, Paul. Thank you very much, Wojciech. Uh, um, I know you both have to leave us, so thank you very much, both of you, for your time this morning and for giving this uh, uh, a very good start to our annual conference. Thank you both, Vera, and to you, Wojciech. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Have a good conference. Thank Fruitful discussion. Bye. Thank, thank you, you very Bye. much. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our third keynote address of the morning uh, from Craig Federighi, Senior Vice President of Software Engineering at Apple. Over to you, Craig. Thank you, Paul. My name is Craig Federighi. I'm Apple's head of software engineering, and I'm here today to talk about our work to protect and strengthen privacy, not only in Apple's products, but across the technology industry. This topic could not be more important. Like you, I believe that privacy is a fundamental human right, and all of us in both government and business have an obligation to protect that right. At Apple, this is not just a matter of advocacy in capitals across Europe, 
nor a matter of compliance or stay on the right side of regulations. Our commitment goes deeper than that. It's built right into everything we create. And I mean that literally. My team and I build the operating systems that power all of Apple's products, from the underlying frameworks to the applications to the user interfaces. We're responsible not only for upholding Apple's commitments to privacy, but for actually embodying those commitments as code. Never before has the right to privacy, the right to keep personal data under your own control, been under assault like it is today. As external threats to privacy continue to evolve, our work to counter them must as well. I'd like to share a few insights into the approaches that Apple engineers have taken to maximize privacy and to give users control of their data. And I wanna tell you about the direction we hope to go as a company and in partnership with policymakers like you. Privacy has been a core commitment at Apple since the very beginning. Apple began in the 1970s as a personal computer company. Now the word personal was not incidental. The computer was yours and the data was too, stored in those days on floppy disks. The data wasn't on a server somewhere operated by someone else. It was quite literally in a shoebox next to you on your desk. It's hard to overstate how radical that was relative to the reality before us today. When I first worked for Apple in the 90s, privacy was not a thing that most tech companies really talked about. People in the industry thought we at Apple had some kind of weird fixation on privacy. And you know, they were right. Privacy was and remains one of our deepest values. People who work at Apple are attracted not just by our products, but by our values. Our culture is built around creating the kinds of products we want for ourselves, for our friends, and for our families. We want our privacy respected, and we want the same for customers around the world. So when it comes to privacy, our commitment starts at the top with our CEO, Tim Cook, our executive team, and our board, and it flows through every part of the company. We live by four key principles, and they build upon each other. First and foremost, and this is a familiar idea here in Europe, is data minimization. The mass centralization of data puts privacy at risk, no matter who's collecting it and what their intentions might be. So we believe Apple should have as little data about our customers as possible. Now, others take the opposite approach. They gather, sell, and hoard as much of your personal information as they can. And the result is a data industrial complex where shadowy actors work to infiltrate the most intimate parts of your life and exploit whatever they can find, whether to sell you something to radicalize your views or worse. Now that's unacceptable. And the solution has to start with not collecting the data in the first place. Now, second, to avoid the risks of moving data off device, Apple processes as much of your data on your own device as possible. Data that stays on your own device is data that you control. Third, when data is collected by Apple, we make that transparent and we help you control how it's used. And finally, we see security as the foundation for all of our privacy protections. If your data isn't secure, it's not going to stay private. And our unique model of integrated hardware and software is key to enabling these strong protections. Now, I'd like to describe how we put these principles into practice. At Apple, every product and every feature is assigned a lead from our dedicated team of privacy engineers. From day one in the design process, they work alongside the other engineers as part of the core project team. Now, I imagine many other companies can say something like this, but what makes us different is that Apple's privacy engineers are not trying to find justifications to collect as much data as possible. Quite the opposite. If we can't say that we've ensured the best outcome for privacy and the user experience, then we won't ship that software to our customers, period. Now, the creation of iPhone was a critical juncture in the expression of these privacy values. And in designing iPhone, we understood we were creating a more personal device than any that had come before, one that would be with you wherever you go, one that would become integral to how you live, work, and communicate and one that would constantly have a network connection. We were stepping into an exciting space, but it was also a space where the stakes were exceptionally high. We knew that we'd have to architect an unprecedented level of privacy protection into this new and even more personal, personal computer. 
Now, enabling truly private communication was one of the first challenges we faced right from the beginning. Our customers were not only using iPhone to record some of their most important experiences in their lives and to store some of their most sensitive information, they were also sharing some of those things with other people. And they rightly expected that those communications would be private, no less so than a conversation they might have in person in a closed room. The problem is that communication over the internet is rarely so direct as that. When you communicate with another person online, your message doesn't reach them until it's traveled through a number of intermediaries, from the free Wi-Fi you might use to the internet service providers that are the backbone of the internet. If the data you send is unprotected, those intermediaries and others are able to listen in on your conversation and they can exploit what you say for their own purposes. So we chose to build end-to-end -end encryption into iPhone's core communication tools, beginning with FaceTime in 2010 and continuing with iMessage in 2011. The result is that iPhone users don't have to worry that their private conversations using iMessage and FaceTime will be intercepted. We've designed these features so that bad actors can't listen to these communications and neither can anyone at Apple. For quite a while, Apple was the only major technology company to provide that protection. Others developed their own systems, but they were systems that didn't have privacy foremost in mind. Some, in fact, were designed specifically to collect your personal information, to track it, to store it, compile it, and even monetize it. End-to-end -end encryption would counteract all of that, so other companies didn't offer it. But over time, their customers saw that the protections that Apple customers enjoyed and demanded those protections for themselves. So now, 10 years after Apple launched FaceTime, even the most data-hungry com technology companies have started building encryption into their communication products. For those of us at Apple, that's actually deeply gratifying. As Tim Cook has said, we wanna be the ripple in the pond that creates larger changes. And that means showing customers that it's absolutely possible to design technology that both respects their privacy and protects their personal information. So customers should expect that and demand it. And that's what we see happening. In other words, we don't define success as standing alone. When it comes to privacy protections, we're very happy to see our competitors copy our work or develop innovative privacy features of their own that we can learn from. At Apple, we are passionate advocates for privacy protections for all users. We'd love to see people buy our products, of course, but we would also love to see robust competition among companies for the best, the strongest, and the most empowering privacy features. Of course, communication isn't the only area where these protections are necessary. Location is another. Where you go says a lot about who you are, like whether you go to a particular place of worship or a particular medical clinic that specializes in a particular illness there's an enormous potential for this kind of data to be misused. And the way some apps are designed, users may have no idea that they're giving it away. For that reason, Apple's view is that users deserve to be more aware and in control of their location data. That's why we said it's not enough for an app to ask you once whether it's okay to track your location, and then years later, even if you've never opened that app again, to continue tracking you in the background. We've added new features so that users can allow access only while using the app or only for one session, giving users more granular control. We've also added reminders for users so that when they've granted an app background access to their location, they can find out later that that location is continuing to be used in the background. So now it's up to you whether you want that access to continue. Our customers have been happy to use those controls and third-party data clearly demonstrates this. The ad tech firm Location Sciences reports that they've seen a 68% reduction in background location data available for targeting for iOS users since iOS 13 shipped last year. Now, this year, we saw another opportunity to empower users. Now, all of us are familiar with apps that ask to track your exact location. And some apps need that level of specificity to provide turn-by-turn -turn directions, for example, but many others do not. For instance, apps that provide local recommendations don't need to know precisely where you are, where you live, or where you work, which again can tell them exactly who you are, an approximate location, 
roughly 20 square kilometers around you, for instance, is more than sufficient. And the same is true for local news apps, which can help you learn about what's happening in the city you're in without knowing the street corner you're standing on. And that's why with iOS 14, we launched a feature called Approximate Location to enable users to only provide apps with an approximate location. This is data minimization in action. Apps only have what's necessary and nothing more. This is another place where I think we've raised the bar for the technology industry. Apple led the way with more granular location controls, and now our competitors are beginning to provide them as well. Now, this brings me to one of the biggest privacy challenges we all face, tracking. Apple has long been a leader on this issue, even before we launched iPhone, in fact. When we introduced our browser, Safari, in 2003, we were the first to block third-party cookies. Now, you're all well aware that on other browsers, certain ads will follow you from site to site. And what that tells you is that data brokers and advertisers have come up with new ways to track you online. And this was our motivation three years ago to introduce Intelligent Tracking Prevention, or ITP for short, to detect and block covert tracking on the web. ITP uses machine learning on your device to distinguish between sites you're visiting and sites you're not. So when sites that you're not visiting try to load your data, ITP stops them from doing so. And to give you even more awareness of what's happening, Safari now gives you a privacy report showing you the tracking activity that ITP has detected. When we launched ITP, other companies, the ones that had grown very attached to invasive tracking, said that users didn't deserve to have these protections. And they claimed that ITP would, quote, sabotage the economic model of the internet. Well, that hasn't happened. Users have far stronger protections than they did before. And instead of collapsing, these companies have adapted. The ad industry as a whole has posted revenue increases every year since ITP launched, even as users' privacy is now better protected. Much like our encryption and location privacy features, ITP has also helped users understand that they can and should expect privacy protections in their web browser. As a result, the technology industry is again following us down this path. Of course, there's more to do on this front, and there always will be. We're especially excited about one additional feature that for us represents the front line of user privacy today. You can think of it in effect as ITP for apps. The new feature is called App Tracking Transparency, or ATT. Its aim is to empower our users to decide when or if they want to allow an app to track them in a way that could be shared across other companies' apps or websites. To do that, early next year, we'll begin requiring all apps that want to do that to obtain their users' explicit permission. And developers who fail to meet that standard can have their apps taken down from the App Store. Requiring permission is a big change from the world we live in now. And because it's a big change, it has to be made in collaboration with the developers themselves. We want to make sure that everyone is able to continue to deliver a rich experience for users. Of course, some advertisers and tech companies would prefer that ATT is never implemented at all. When invasive tracking is your business model, you tend not to welcome transparency and customer choice. Just as with ITP, some in the ad industry are lobbying against these efforts, claiming that ATT will dramatically hurt ad-supported businesses. But we expect the industry will adapt as it did before, providing effective advertising, but this time without invasive tracking. Getting this right will take time, collaboration, listening, and true partnership across the entire technology ecosystem. But we believe the result will be transformative. That goal, to constantly raise the bar for privacy across the technology industry, is one that all of us here share, and it's one that we can only achieve together in collaboration as leaders in government and business. Through GDPR and other policies, many of which have been implemented by Commissioner Yourova and Commissioner Reinders and others here with us today, Europe has shown the world what a privacy-friendly future could look like. Indeed, Apple has called for an omnibus privacy law in the U.S. that would mirror the European approach, one that empowers consumers to minimize data collection of their data, to know when and why it's being collected, to access, correct, or delete that data, 
and to know that it's truly secure. Yet, on their own, even the most visionary laws are not enough in themselves. These principles behind the regulation have to find expression in the technology that companies like Apple create. So as policymakers look to the evolving landscape and decide what steps are essential, we do the same with the unique tools at our disposal. Speaking again as an engineer, we are never content. Old solutions become out of date pretty quickly and the pace of change is relentless. But so I think is the pace of progress. Every day we're working to expand the frontier of what's possible to deliver great product experiences and great privacy without compromising either. Of course, the tools available to engineers and policymakers are very different, but our efforts can inform and reinforce one another as they must. Together, we achieve results that would be impossible alone. For those reasons and more, we at Apple need your partnership. It's already clear that some companies are gonna do everything they can to stop app tracking transparency or any innovation like it and to maintain their unfettered access to people's data. Some have already begun to make outlandish claims like saying that AT&T, which helps users control when they're tracked, that it'll somehow lead to greater privacy invasions. To say that we're skeptical of those claims would be an understatement, but that won't stop these companies from making false arguments to get what they want. We need the world to see those arguments for what they are, a brazen attempt to maintain the privacy invasive status quo. ATT, we believe, reflects both the spirit and the requirements of both the e-privacy directive and the plan updates in the draft e-privacy regulation. ATT, like e-privacy, is about giving people the power to make informed choices about what happens to their data. I hope that the lawmakers, regulators, and privacy advocates here today will continue to stand up for strong privacy protections like these. I also hope that you will strengthen Europe's support for end-to-end -end encryption. Apple strongly supported the European Parliament when it proposed a requirement that the e-privacy regulations support end-to-end -end encryption, and we will continue to do so. You can also count on us to keep doing more to empower our users to control their own data. We'll keep working to raise the bar on what people expect and keep challenging the entire technology industry to clear that bar. In technology, evolution can happen so quickly that five or 10 years can seem like a very long time. But when I consider Apple's work on privacy, I take a much longer view. I try to imagine how the work we're doing can impact the future decades from now, even a century from now. now. I can't be sure, but I do have a hope. I hope that we'll be remembered, not just for the devices we developed and what they enabled people to do, but also for helping humanity enjoy the benefits of this great technology without requiring that they give up their privacy to do it. It's in our power today to end that false trade-off, to build for the long-term not just a foundation of technology, but a foundation of trust. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. That was very thought provoking and a glimpse into the future. Uh, we're gonna move rapidly on now to our first panel discussion of the morning. Uh, is the GDPR delivering the full potential of EU data protection principles? And I'll hand over to Aline Shivo. Uh, stay with us. <laughs> 